Okay, okay. Well, I think that um, my talk today is going to be sort of the counterpoint to the uh, talk you just heard. Um, because I feel that um, the perspective I can give is probably one that's more in the trenches and I think also needs to be equally valued. This is the psychiatrist office. Um, we call this affectionately the medication closet. Um, it is in a trailer. Um, it is in a probation camp for girls. It is behind very, very high fence, razor wire, just outside the door. It's an old brick building that um, is headquarters. Before you can get in, you have to go through the electronic gate. You have to say hello to the probation office. They have to check you in. And sometimes they affectionately call you psych. And that is my day. The other thing I do is I'm also a health services researcher for probably about 20 years. What I've been doing is working on quantitative data sets, looking at the quality of child mental health care. Um, and um, I think M Health has really been a really important um, trajectory for me because it's really out of frustration, and I think you know your other presentation can also agree. How many times can we done large state, large quantitative data sets showing high need for mental health care, the quality of care in public mental health systems is poor, and nobody gets better? The other experience I bring to M Health is that I was a training director for about 12 years, graduated 72 child fellows while raising two children. And so I think it's with that perspective um, that I wanted to share sort of my introduction to M Health for child mental health. Some of the guiding principles are that mental health problems are common, treatable, and costly, that adherence to national treatment guidelines are, quote, expected to be associated with improved clinical outcomes. This is a big deal because what we have is we have a lot of treatment guidelines saying, this is what the physician is recommended to do. And if you do it, the assumption is that there's going to be good clinical outcomes. But at least in child psychiatry, I don't think the evidence is there. The other thing that's really important, and I think to echo again sort of the earlier talk, but particularly in mental health care, communication is key to good care. Why is that? Because <coughs> You have to communicate to make the diagnosis. Also, in thinking about treating that person and making decisions about that treatment, you have to listen to that person. OK? There's very few biologic markers. So I think what's wonderful about mental health, particularly <laughs> psychiatry, is that it's paramount that we also preserve this patient-provider relationship. Um, what's really important, too, is that relationship can be quite dynamic. Um, and um, over time, ideally, it will shift in trust um, and in uh, sharing confidential information. The other thing that's very important in a challenge with mental health is that communication also includes other decision makers. We've got children, youth, parents, adult caregivers. And oftentimes, I think in other fields of medicine, we sometimes minimize the role of these other decision makers, right? So for example, if you're a surgical patient, you're sitting there in pre-op, you're handed an informed consent, you sign it. But how many people were in that person's life that really influenced that decision to agree to get that surgery or to get that treatment? The other thing, too, is with communication, it's essential to have communication across providers. And typically in care coordination, in using, for example, like EHRs, um, care coordination is initially conceptualized as the primary care to the medical specialist and vice versa. But in mental health care, we've got a lot more challenges, particularly with children. We've got multiple sectors that don't talk to each other. Schools, foster care, juvenile justice, residential treatment facility. And so think about sort of the need for data infrastructure. Where is that going to come from? And the challenges of beginning to communicate between the hospital or the outpatient clinic and these other sectors that are ch serving children. The other thing, too, and I think this is a beauty of M Health, is the emphasis on, on the dynamic nature of M Health and how data is coming in. And one of the things that's really important in mental health 
is that the shared care decision processes actually shift over time. They can be influenced by the child's development, and anybody who's raised teenagers should know that, um, and also the clinical status of that patient. Someone who might be severely depressed or psychotic or also unfortunately sometimes is so ill, loses the ability to consent and be legally competent are challenges as far as thinking about mobile health. So I hope we agree. The other thing too is again, mental health care is multi-level. And so if you look at this child here, the question is where do you begin? Where do you begin to begin to think about uh, promoting healthy development and reducing this child's risk for mental health problems? The other thing, too, is in mental health care, we can't always assume that there's a functional system at the other end of that link, of that, of that text message, of sending you know, um, you know, um, an alert to a provider. And here, for example, is also a reminder of the threats of external validity. Um, in 2012, there was a new governor that came into town in the state of Illinois, and he cut mental health funds. And this is an example of a protest where 20 community mental health centers were abruptly shut. So in working with um, a child psychiatrist, thinking in terms of some of the brainstorming we've had on our MH2 team, there's a lot of sharing of vocabulary. What is a DSM-5 diagnostic criteria? What are evidence-based psychotherapies? What are the psychotropic medication classes and side effect profiles? What are the treatment guidelines, national quality measures that we may want to promote adherence to? How do you describe fidelity to treatment? How do you ex describe adherence? And, and this messy thing called medication titration, oftentimes children may be on more than one medication or they're cross titrating, and how do we capture that and support that? So key questions, again, some of this from earlier um, presentations. How can we use mHealth to improve access to mental health care? continuity of care, adherence to recommended care, patient-provider communication, care coordination, and this amorphous thing called patient-centered care. So experts, and I think I also want to reinforce experts are community partners. And I think we've called them end users. Uh, we've talked about uh, using physician champions and clinics. But it's very, very important, and in our earlier work with MH2, we've taken very much a community-partnered approach from beginning to end, including the mental health consumers, including the primary caregivers of children with mental health problems, including providers from multiple disciplines and settings. Also, quality assurance. If you're thinking about in creating an mHealth intervention in a clinic, why should the people in quality assurance care? Why do you want to win-win there? Who is mandated to report adherence to national quality measures for Medicaid billing, right? So if you create something that can also help them do their job better, you might get a little bit more buy-in. Why in care about agency leaders? It's really important that your intervention be fitting within their mission, okay? Within the LA County Department of Mental Health, like many departments of mental health, Thank goodness, they're, they're sort of waving the banner that we should use technology. Uh, it's also very important that as you think about creating anything, that it also comply with the policies and procedures of that organization. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, our social scientists and the elegant theories and, and the, the real important to have a rationale for why we develop certain things and why we think behavior is going to change. Our methodologists, you know, I think probably the best contribution I can give to our statisticians is messy data sets, real community data, for them to cut their teeth on and help me do a better job in, in um, analyzing that data and taking into account all of these other artifacts that come into play um, when working in a messy community-based data set. Computer scientists, engineers, I admire you. Um, it's great what you do. Uh, you're essential. And I also wanted to give a shout out also to um, legal uh, guidance. I'm very grateful to an attorney. Her name is Kate Fibiger. 
She actually works here at UCLA, and she's actually a software programmer as well as an attorney. And I think that when you are a full-time uh, professor in a university, and you're starting for the first time to think about creating some type of mHealth intervention, it's really, really helpful to get in touch with those folks, get some guidance, um, and it was with her support that we were able to trademark MH2, mobile health to mental health, to UC Regents. So here is my humble start, and I think, again, it's really sort of sharing, I think, with the group a stimulus for all of us to keep learning together today. Um, and what typically happens is when a, a child is diagnosed with ADHD, usually about age eight or nine, fourth grade is usually where uh, the rubber hits the road. The mother comes in, she's had several years of complaints from the school system about her kid, her kid's now not being invited to birthday parties, not being able to make friends, she's, she's harassed, she's being blamed by family that she's not being a good enough disciplinarian, and so she comes finally to the child psychiatrist, um, or pediatrician for that matter. She's given the diagnosis that your child has ADHD, it's a chronic condition, it may persist in, through adulthood. Oh, and by the way, here's a prescription for a Schedule II drug that you're supposed to give to your child every day. So can you imagine how that visit sometimes goes over, right? Particularly if you're somebody with not the best health literacy, with maybe some concerns about what it means to put your child on psychiatric medications, what it means to have a label of ADHD, so here's, again, the problem, and again, uh, aligns with some of the guiding principles we talked about earlier. Uh, the national treatment guidelines, believe it or not, for ADHD require use of standardized rating scales. And actually, the way that we comply with that guideline is we hand the mother a, a paper rating form, and then we give her another copy that she's supposed to give to the teacher and she's supposed to go to the teacher, get it completed, and bring it back to the next visit. And on top of it, she can do this anytime in whatever state of mind she wants to be. Uh, but that is our state-of-the-art treatment guideline. So you can imagine there's inconsistent completion, and also, clinically, how much do you really read into that rating form, right? The other thing, and, and again, again to emphasize sort of the earlier point, is insurance companies are not going to be increasing reimbursement for uh, medication follow-up visits. So they are very brief. And frankly, you know, after a couple of years of treating ADHD, it's kind of boring for the clinician to do sort of the checklist, all the symptoms, all the side effects. And can you imagine what it feels like to that parent to also be rushed through to sort of be able to, oh my gosh, I better remember this, that, and the other thing. I only have a few minutes to explain everything, right? And so it's really important that somehow we be using mHealth technology to better use the time, i.e. to focus on the concerns of the parent or the child, to better understand the context of the symptoms, the side effects, in order to make a better treatment decision. So using mHealth technologies, we've talked again about reminders for uh, clinic visit adherence and medication adherence, but how about parent-provider communication? I think one of the classic issues that's really a concern among physicians is, is that physicians now carry their laptop by the bedside, and they're not looking at the pa patient. They're not listening to the loved one. In child psychiatry, you cannot do that. I mean, that is the essence of caring for that child. Um, and the other issue is parent-centered medication management. In using mHealth interventions, how do we integrate the data that's coming in with the tool, with the data that's coming in with the parent, and also looking at the decision that is being made about that child's medication? How can we create new study variables that integrate all of those different data sources to redefine what this parent-centered medication management should be? Here's our system architecture, it's very basic. Um, and just to share with you a little bit about the MH2 features, here's the reminders. Um, you see UCLA colors on MH2. Um, the other thing too is you see nothing on the early interface that says ADHD mental health. 
okay? Um, and that little red arrow goes down depending on what the parent is supposed to do. And here's the reminders. Um, the parent sets her own timer, so typically um, with stimulant medication, it's important to get breakfast in the kid and then give the pill and then get to school. Um, and so you see, did your uh, child take ADHD medication today? Yes, no. And if she wants to know exactly, okay, how much, when, blah, 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 she can push a button and uh, the medication that was prescribed is right there. Here are the clinic visit appointments. Again, she sets her own timer um, and it's set, I'll show you in a minute, by the uh, clinician, and um, according to feedback from parents, they wanted appointments one week, three day, and one day prior to next visit. And again, there's also a button if they want to remember, okay, how do I get there? What's the address? What's the phone? They can do that. Here's the parent interface for ratings, and it's a standardized rating scale, Vanderbilt, um, uh, that is used uh, to comply with national treatment guidelines. This brings up a really interesting issue, and that is, is that we talk about standardized ratings, and this is what we're supposed to do. But actually, this is, quote, the state of the art, but it's 18 items. So a lot of work that we really need to do is to try to figure out how to shorten that and how to sort it. And we've even had to um, alter a little bit so that um, the question was one line. And if they wanted additional information, they could, because some of the survey items add way too much detail. Um, the other thing, too, is um, we wonder whether just that act of being able to, to rate the symptoms, rate the side effects early on may sort of help the parent feel a little bit more confident with this very overwhelming responsibility of having now to monitor this child. So here is um, some of the replies, both parent education, we've used some of Cynthia Whittam's parenting tips, and support. Um, and one thing that we got as feedback from the families, uh, particularly the mothers, was that they are blamed for their child's behavior. Um, and that oftentimes they felt that they haven't disciplined the child, they're not working hard enough. And so in addition to these, um, you know, parenting tips, we've also included uh, just some support messages. You're doing a good job. And even R-E-S-P, E-C-T. And you know, that is one of our favorite replies. And then here's our timers so that, um, that the mom uh, can, uh, or dad, can um, tailor to sort of when the kid gets up and then when he or she wants to do her ratings. The other thing that was really important um, when we sort of uh, showed earlier prototypes to parents was they wanted to see their report. And even though, you know, I thought, oh, that's great, you know, that feeds back, they can see what they're doing, it will reinforce, blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't it at all. The reason why they wanted that was they wanted to feel prepared when they went to the doctor. They didn't want surprises. And so what we did is we created this My Report button so that they could see what the doctor was going to see on her iPad during the visit. We also tried to comply with national treatment guidelines with um, developing a teacher interface with a link with a via email on Tuesdays and Thursdays. With parent permission, the teacher gets an email with a reminder and a link on the uh, symptom ratings. Here's the provider iPad. Um, and just to drill down, you see the medication adherence. This is per parent report. So here in this example, it's 57%. And one of the first things that we always do when you know, we sit down, we say, well, how's Johnny doing, blah, 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 is he taking his medication? And of course you get the, oh yeah, oh yeah, do you know what I mean? But here is an opportunity to actually then say, okay, let's walk it through. And so here we, we push down on the button, we can see which days the parent said yes, no, and what's missing. Now what's really, really important, unlike uh, medications like hypertension, there might be a really good reason why that parent chose not to give that med. And that's okay. Think about Labor Day's coming up. You're, you, there's no school. Maybe the kid doesn't have any homework. Maybe the parents want to have the kid have a drug holiday, right? 
So it's really important here, unlike some of the other medications that have to be taken chronically, like uh, insulin or, or uh, beta blocker, that we understand the context of the adherence. And here, what's important is um, when uh, the clinic visit is wrapping up, the clinician says, okay, Mrs. Smith, um, I can see you again in three weeks and we'll follow up and we'll see sort of how this medication is doing and let me know how school is going and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the clinician enters the time for the next appointment and this gets fed into the parent's smartphone and then uh, reminders at one, three, one week, three days, and one day. So here's what the physician sees. Um, and again, it's aggregating all of the parent and teacher data, uh, different colors for parent data, different color for teacher data, uh, both side effects and symptoms. And the other thing that was really important was thinking about, well, what is, it, what is the win-win, again, for the clinician? Well, the clinician wants to be able to not only make a, a good decision about medication based on whether they're taking it or not, but also the type of ADHD symptoms. And so if you hover over the symptom bar, you can actually split the symptom bar into inattentive and hyperactive. And what's really important there is that sometimes people feel that certain stimulant medications target one class of symptoms over the other. Five minutes, no problem. The other thing is the side effects. Um, oftentimes we focus on physical side effects like low appetite or the child's not sleeping or headaches, but there's also emotional side effects to stimulant medication that sometimes get forgotten to be asked. And so it's really important then that when you hover over this bar, we actually were able to, um, um, what I did is I coded on the side effect profiles, which ones were physical, which ones were emotional, to sort of again get a little bit of a boost and a higher sensitivity to thinking about the emotional symptoms uh, on, a side of, on a stimulant meds. So we've had many, many challenges, and I think if anything, you can use me as a, to, as a test case of somebody who is in the trenches, who is learning the hard way, um, but at the same time, very, very grateful for the learning. Um, I think one of the big issues for us has been continuity and software development and refinement. You know, the, the coding for MH2 is nothing special. It's, it's sort of putting together SQL and HTML, and, and so it's not really something that would be of interest um, to build one's computer science dissertation about. But not, not, nonetheless, we do need continued uh, support to uh, make sure our documentation is good, that when we find bugs, we're able to refine them. The other thing, too, that's, that, again, you learn the hard way is actually our server got upgraded. It was a well-intentioned thing. We sort of were on Bruin Online and then we switched to Google. But we're really sensitive about making sure that when our text messages and our reminders go out, that they're not spam, that they actually still go to the parent. So what happened here was actually we had one of our parents say, no, I'm not getting any of the reminders. And we scratched our head and our programmer said, no, no, I haven't done anything. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't somebody upgrade our server a couple weeks ago? Oh, yeah. OK. So quirky things like that happen. Pilot testing in the community is very slow. Um, and I think, again, you can hear from the earlier talk, attention about sort of how much uh, do we need to sort of have our research rigorous enough to support the evidence supporting its effectiveness versus how much do we just get it out there to, quote, help people. Compliance is a big issue. HIPAA. IRB, the County, County of Los Angeles Department of Mental Health actually had their own data privacy uh, standards and we had to upgrade our server for that. Clinicaltrials.gov, of course, you have to register. Trademark, how long does it take to get a trademark? 37 light years. <laughs> it's not 17 years and it's not 37 light years. And I didn't know myself, okay? But I did think like, hmm, mental, mobile health for mental health. That's kind of cute. The MH2, UCLA colors. OK, that's cool. That doesn't look like it's you know, ADHD or you know, terrible medications. So thank, thank goodness with CAT. You, I actually started before we collected any sort of data, and we were still in sort of the concept phase. And it took about two years. And for anybody who wants to go through this, because there is a period of time where then you know, your idea has to go out there in public for about 90 days before it'll pass. And I can't believe it passed. But the other thing, too, that um, 
is you have to show evidence of interstate commerce on your trademark. But guess what counts? A research poster, okay? So believe it or not, I took a selfie in front of an MH2 research conference at like, I think we were in Florida or something, whatever, at the, at the academy meeting. Uh, the lawyer says, I need evidence. I said, will this do? I sent her the photo of me, you know, whatever, and it passed. <laughs> so, so anybody who wants to go for trademark, interstate commerce, there you go. Uh, funding sources, and again, our community partners have been really, really key in uh, helping us think about this. Uh, we've had good engagement um, um, on all levels, and I'm very grateful, but that also took a lot of time to build. And so here I wanted to end, really, sort of the session again with a question, and that is, where do we begin? Thank you.